buckle up everybody because in this video i am going to play several clips of some absolutely astounding and amazing things you may have not seen. Some are gonna involve the Prime Minister of Israel, another of Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority speaking in Arabic with my translation, and you're gonna watch a cool clip between Benjamin Netanyahu and Elon Musk, and all of it has biblical ramifications. Stay tuned, this is gonna be a good one. Well, folks, as I've said it before, Israel has been all over the media, and there's been a lot going on, especially as of late. And folks, it's not really a coincidence, especially during the season in which we're in right now, where many of the holy holidays are being celebrated right now, the feasts going on as uh, we're in a very unique time, at least in the time of this recording and as I said before, there are a lot of people who are telling a lot of lies about what's going on in Israel. And I want to start this off by just simply saying this. God makes it clear in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when he promised Abraham that he would bless those that blessed him and curse those that cursed him. And in essence, what he was talking about was he was going to bless anybody that blessed Israel or curse anybody that would curse Israel and I don't know why this seems to be such a difficult aspect for people to grasp. And what's even more amazing than this is we know what happened with God and the nation of Israel, right? We know that God established a covenant with them. We know that God made a promise uh, to all of the forefathers, reiterating the covenant that was made, saying that he would bless them. Look, he said, you look up, you see the sun, the moon, the stars, you know that Israel is going to be around. As long as they're around, Israel's going to be around. And this has a lot of real significance with respect to Bible prophecy, especially when we deal with the issue of the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Now, there has been a lot of confusion about the population of Arabs that live in Israel by the name of Palestinians. At least that's what they're referred to right now. There's an interesting history, by the way, about the Palestinians and how they got the name that they actually got. And I thought that it would be a really good idea to share some highlights from a series of uh, clippings that I took from one big interview that Benjamin Netanyahu did with Jordan Peterson. Now, this is really cool because we're going to go over, uh, truthfully, we're going to go over four different videos, right? The first video is he gives us a good, solid Jewish history in about five minutes. The next one is he's going to talk to us about the fabrications that exist regarding Jewish history. And then he's going to talk about um, describing what Israel actually was before the Jews had reestablished the land and, and kind of what all of that means. And then after that, we're going to get into what he's calling the next step of Israel's economy. Now, all of this has significant biblical relevance to it. I think it's really, really important. And I think that it's uh, very, very clear that by all of this, we should be able to be better students of what the Bible says concerning Israel in the last day. You're going to be blessed by this. And then, by the way, I'm going to get into a video that you are going to hear in Arabic by Mahmoud Abbas that I'm going to translate for you that's going to absolutely break your heart. And if you really want to know what the thought is, the prevailing thought of the Palestinian Authority, you're going to find out by listening to this video. And hopefully by the time we get to at the end of this video, you're going to have an understanding of what's really going on. The one thing that I want to say is that God makes it clear, guys. This is not something that we should question. This is not something that we should uh, uh, look at and say, how can this be? The Bible tells us how it can be. It makes it clear. We know the promises that God made towards his ancestrally chosen people, the Jews, and we should actually understand it, respect it, and walk according to what it says. We are undoubtedly in the last days. The fact that Israel is a nation right now is a massive deal. And it's something we should pay attention to. So let's start with the first clip, and then I'll provide some commentary afterwards. Then we'll get into the second, the third, and the fourth. And then after that, we're going to get into this situation with Mahmoud Abbas, who is the leader of the Palestinian Authority. And I'm telling you, it's going to disgust you. So just get ready. Uh, this one's going to be an ugly one. Okay, so uh, let's watch this. Should be very interesting. Uh, this is Benjamin Netanyahu who is right now speaking about a good summary of Jewish history. So let's get right into it. 
Herzl was what I call our modern Moses. But I'd actually start with the original Moses. Uh, the Jewish people uh, have lived in the land of Israel, what is now the, the state of Israel, uh, have lived here and have been attached to this place for about 3,500 years. Three and a half millennia. Now, for the first two millennia, roughly, of that time, uh, we were living in what is described in a text commonly known as the Bible. So the Bible describes how the Jewish people lived on this land, were attached to this land, fought off conquerors, sometimes were conquered, but stayed on their land. And that uh, continued uh, for a very long time until roughly the 6th, 7th century, actually, uh, after the birth of Christ, okay? For, for roughly for 2,000 years. Uh, we were conquered by the Romans. We were conquered by the Byzantines. They did a lot of bad things to us, but they didn't really exile us, contrary to what people think, okay? The, ones, uh, the, the, the loss of our land actually occurred when the Arab conquest took place in the seventh century. The Arabs burst out from Arabia, and they did something that no other conqueror, not the Romans, not the Byzantines, not the Greeks before them, not Alexander the Great, nobody did before. They actually started taking over the land of the Jewish farmer. They brought in military colonies that took over the land. And gradually over the next two centuries, the Jews became a minority in our land. So it is under the Arab conquest that the Jews lost their homeland. The Arabs were the colonials. The Jews were the natives dispossessed. And by the way, I want to stop when he talks about this because there is one thing that he isn't speaking about, and that's the ancient history. Because he talks about the Romans, he talks about the Greeks, but what he isn't mentioning here, and I think he's doing this on purpose just simply because it's not relevant to the issue that he's discussing right now with respect to the Palestinian Authority and what's going on with the Palestinians. But if you remember your Jewish history, you'll know that Israel, uh, the land of Israel was given to uh, God's ancestrally chosen people early on, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And then they held possession of it. They became or were a unified nation under one king. We know that basically Rehoboam was the very last king of Israel that ruled it as a unified nation. There was, in essence, a civil war that breaks out between the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, as you guys know this, and you know that eventually the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians, even though many people that were in uh, the north were still allowed to stay in the land. But then what happened was the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, specifically on the 9th of Av, 586 BC. This is, by the way, where everybody celebrates Tishba Av, if you think about this. What ends up happening here is Israel, uh, or the, the Jerusalem is destroyed, right? And then they are exiled out of Jerusalem. But what a lot of people don't know is that Israel, although Jerusalem was not occupied because the Babylonians emptied them out of Jerusalem, the ancient capital was no longer occupied uh, by their rightful owners, by the Jews. There are lots of areas of the biblical boundaries of Israel that we know of today that have always been occupied by Jews up until the point, the time point that Netanyahu is actually talking about here. And I thought that that would be an important uh, disruption to make so that you guys are aware of it. You kind of, kind of understand uh, where that's going. And I'm going to try not to disrupt him anymore, but I just want you guys to see that part of it. And I think from this point on, we'll just let him play all the way through. Well, that happens in history. The Jews were dispossessed. We were flung to the far corners of the earth, uh, suffered unimaginable suffering because we had no homeland, but we didn't disappear. And we never gave up the dream of coming back to our ancestral homeland. So generation after generation, Jews could be in Warsaw, they could be in Yemen, they could be in, uh, they could be in China. And they said, next year in Jerusalem, we'll come back next year in Jerusalem. Well, that uh, was made possible because the Arabs who had conquered the land basically left it barren. They never made it their own. It was a barren land. It really had, practically it was an empty land. And in the 19th century, the idea of coming back next year in Jerusalem became a reality. By the way, in part because of Christian Zionist support for the idea of the great return. The Jews came back in the 19th century to the land of Israel. The result of this return was that we started building farms, factories, places of employment. <laughs> Arabs from nearby countries started emigrating and they now became, they call themselves 
Palestinians. They reconstructed history and said, we've been here for centuries. No, they haven't. They weren't there at all. And they didn't have a national consciousness. We came back, made it our land. And we said, okay, we now will live together. We decided to establish a state in 1948. That's 75 years ago. And we, we said, everybody can live here. The Arabs said, there can't be a Jewish state. You have no right to be here. It's our land. It's not your land. It's been our land for 3,500 years. If you took over your, uh, somebody's apartment, knocked them out, dispossessed them, and they never gave up the claim, and they said, it's our claim, and you left this barren dump, okay? And this, the, uh, the, the uh, families, the progeny of the people you, you kicked out came back, rebuilt the house. You cannot come back and tell them, you don't belong here, we're going to kick you out especially since you're latecomers who've come to live in, you know, in part of the house, which is what the so-called Palestinians are, okay? We say to them, you can live here, we can live here, but it's our land, it's our state. And the reason this conflict continues is because the Palestinians, who are, represent the, the, the colonial powers, the Arab conquest uh, of uh, the Middle East and beyond, they are saying, you have no right for a Jewish state. Well, we do. If any people has any right to a state, if any people never gave up their dreams of returning to their ancestral home, if any people rebuilt their home from nothing, from barren, wasted land, it's the Jewish people. To tell them, you who have suffered more than anyone else, you have never lost your dream of coming back and rebuilding your national life in your ancestral homeland, you have no right to be there. But the Arabs who are trying to destroy you, they have that right. That is a complete perversion of history and also a complete perversion of justice. The Jews belong to this land. This land belongs to the Jews. The Palestinians are free to live here next to us, among us, but they're not free to demand the dissolution of the Jewish state. That is not justice. That is injustice. Yeah, so this is a, a powerful statement that he's making, and he's 100% right. Uh, by the way, this is biblical. God made that declaration. And matter of fact, it's interesting because we, in the Old Testament, we actually see evidence in the Bible that the land of Israel, as we know it based on the biblical borders, will never be able to prosper unless God's ancestrally chosen people, the Jews, are in it. So, you know, what he's saying here is 100% correct, and I think it's it's really important that we understand it. So next, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you Netanyahu talking about many of the lies uh, that were created concerning Jewish history, and there are a lot of them. By the way, the, the three and a half minutes or so that you're going to hear him talking about this, he's going to talk about some of them, but there are tons of lies that are being told about the Jewish people and so let's take a listen to what uh, Netanyahu says here. It's very, very important to listen to his details. By the way, he does a remarkable job at cataloging history, which is why I think this is really important. So this is what we're about here, folks. We're about exposing the truth. So let's expose it. Here we go. The Mamluks, uh, the Ottomans, uh, ultimately the British, a series of conquerors. In other words, they, uh, they took over the land, lost the land, and did nothing with the land. So if they had done what you say, if they had created... Uh, if that house that we were expelled from was taken over by another uh, another people, another family, they built a family there, they had children, grandchildren, they extended the porch, they, they, they built a parking garage and so on, it's gone. What can you do? You still have the ability to demand uh, uh, reclamations, uh, compensation and so on. But, you know, tough luck. That happens in history. But that's not what happened. Once the Jews were, were conquered by the Arabs, the Arabs did nothing with it, lost the land to others. Now we come back and bring it back to life 13 centuries later and perform this miracle. And they fabricate a history uh -huh. where we were there all the time. It was a verdant homeland. It was built up. It was nothing of the kind. It was desert. It was nothing. Now, Okay, so I'm going to be really brief about me stopping this area, but I do think it is important to, to point this out because he is 100% right. And I don't want to stop to add commentary to what he's saying here, but I do want to point out one very simple fact, and that is one of Satan's greatest tactics as it relates to telling lies is he rewrites history. He loves to rewrite history. And that's exactly what's happening here as he is attacking the sovereignty of the Jewish people. We know that this is going to happen in the last days, and this is an example of how it's happening. So let's continue on. Now, it's not merely Mark Twain and Arthur Penrin Stanley who say that. 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of travelogues over the centuries of, of uh, famous uh, French poets, of uh, Swiss travelers, of German uh, theologians, everybody, of poets, writers, uh, travelers who describe exactly the same thing. There was nothing there. There was no Palestinian state. There were no Palestinians. They didn't even, uh, the Arabs even didn't call themselves that. And by the way, I am going to play for you a portion of him talking about some of these historians that talked about this, which I think you'll be really interested. It'll actually be our next segment. You're going to really love it. They were calling themselves parts of southern Syria, whatever. There was no national consciousness. There was nothing to form the consciousness about. In the 20th century, the Arab world and the Palestinians and their supporters in the West, among the intellectual elites, basically erased history and recreated a fake history. A fake history that deracinates the Jewish roots that are unparalleled. There is no other story in the history of nations where the, uh, people fought for so long for their land, for thousands of 2,000 years, were dispossessed from it, came back to it, did not kick out <laughs> an existing uh, population with a national consciousness, rebuilt the land, and now are being told you have no connections to it. You were, uh, you know, you're, you're the colonials. No, we're not. We're not. We're not just to just to just to uh, give this, uh, yeah, just to give us a fine point, Jordan, because this is so crucial what we're discussing. And I discuss it in, at considerable length in my book because people are so ignorant of history. We are not the Belgians in the Congo. We're not the Dutch in Indonesia. Okay, we're not the the British in South Africa. We had been there all the time. We had been in the Congo. We had been, if you will, the equivalent in Indonesia. We were kicked out of the Congo and nothing happened in the Congo, nothing. No other people there, no development, nothing, okay? Now we come back, come back to our land, build it up, enable immigration from, uh, of uh, uh, Arabs or now called Palestinians from neighboring lands, and they tell us, oh, you don't belong here, you dispossessed us. This is essentially what Arab propaganda and Palestinian propaganda has done. And what I labored, not only in the present book, my own history, maybe my story, but in a previous book, A Place Among the Nations, to debunk. And you know what? The interesting thing is this, you know, so far, it's, it's quite, quite amazing. No fact that I put forward in any of these books has ever been challenged. Not, not one. Yeah, that's right. And uh, interesting how he uh, has gone unchallenged in it because, of course, the facts that he's sharing are actually true. Uh, so this should not be a surprise to anybody. And so now he's going to talk about um, uh, basically the idea of Israel being a wasteland and the documentation about it. This is really interesting, folks. Pay attention to what he says here. It's unique. You're familiar with the story of Jesus, right? Jesus was a Jewish rabbi living 2,000 years ago. He was a rabbi from the Galilee, okay? He came to Jerusalem, he turned the money tables of the, uh, the, the, the tables of the money changers on the Temple Mount. Where did that happen? Did it happen in Tibet? It happened here. Jerusalem was our capital. King David made it our capital 3,000 years ago. So the Jews are here to try to, uh, uh, to say that they weren't here and that the Palestinians were here thousands of years ago is ridiculous. Anybody, you know, anybody who can, you can actually Google this and, and find out how absurd this thing is. So as far as reinventing ancient history, that is, that is unpardonable because anybody can find out and understand that the Jews were here for thousands of years, the Palestinians weren't here. As far as modern times are concerned, what the Palestinians have said is, oh, and I, <clears throat> I write this in my book, and I show it because it's so comical. What, what uh, they say is, we were here, uh, Palestine was a verdant land in the 19th century, teeming with, uh, you know, with the uh, Palestinians until the Jews came in, uh, took it over and threw it out. Okay, well, that's what Arafat effectively said in his uh, uh, infamous speech in the United Nations, blaming uh, Zionism, equating Zionism with racism. Well, there's only one problem with that. He said that the Jewish invasion of this verdant Palestinian homeland uh, happened in 1881, uh, okay? The problem with that is that uh, 12 years before, a famous visit... 
Okay, by the way, when he talks about 1881, please listen to that date. That date is really important. I'm going to go back and play that again where he talks about 1881. Just to rewind it just slightly because I want you to see as he brings in somebody that you all know well. And he's going to talk about this. So let's uh, pay close attention to what he says here. It's, it's really critical. In uh, 1881, okay? The problem with that is that uh, 12 years before, a famous visitor among hundreds of visitors named Mark Twain, visited the Holy Land. And he describes a totally different picture. He describes Palestine, I'm quoting him, is a vast wasteland. He said, only imagination can grace this barren land with the pomp of uh, circumstance and life. It's just, he said, we traveled for a whole day. We didn't see, in the Galilee, we didn't see a human being, one single human being. He said, Jerusalem sits in sackcloth and ashes. And as he was saying that, it's the Jewish return that began, the Jewish return that began building the land. Well, perhaps one could argue, uh, it's obvious that Mark Twain was not in the service of uh, the Jewish state because it didn't exist. He wasn't in the service of the Jewish lobby because there wasn't any Jewish lobby. He was just reporting what was there. Could there possibly have been a tremendous influx of Palestinians between 1869 and 1881, the year that uh, that uh, Arafat says the Jewish uh, invasion began uh, and destroyed the Palestinian paradise. Well, alas, no, because in the year 1881, another famous visitor visits Israel, and he writes, visits this land, and he writes also his memoirs, okay? His name was Arthur Penryn Stanley. He was a very famous, very famous uh, courtier of uh, Queen Victoria's court, okay? And he came here on a special visit. And he says, I look south and I look north. He says, I'm in Judea. And I see nothing. He says, a barren expanse. And they both express, both Twain and Arthur Penryn Stanley say the same thing. When, when, oh when will the Jews come back and bring this land to life? And the answer is right then. We came back, brought it back to life. Uh, there were Arabs living here, but it was, as I say, a barren wasteland. But Arabs began to immigrate naturally because we created a rise in the standard of living that attracted Arabs from neighboring states. Those Arabs are now those, the descendants of those Arabs who migrated as a result of the Jewish uh, return, many of them now are considered Palestinians. So what I'm saying, uh, and I'm saying this to you, uh, Jordan, and to your audience, there has been a complete fabrication of history. It's the biggest lie of the big lies that have permeated the 20, 20th uh, century and the 21st century is to say that the Arabs were here before, that is, the Palestinians were here before the Jews, when we were here for thousands of years, that we are the colonials, when in fact it was the Arabs who were the colonials who dispossessed the original natives, and that is the Jews, that we came back to this land that was laid barren by the Arab conquest, brought it back to life, and allowed Arab immigration, what we call now Palestinian immigration, to come back in. And now they say to us, in unimaginable chutzpah, you know, they say, you don't belong here. They recreate ancient history, they recreate modern history, and this is a lot of hokum. It's ridiculous. <laughs> there you have it, folks. And he's right. Like, literally, he's right. And the Bible tells us that Israel, look, the land cannot be blessed by God unless his people are in it. So th this completely explains why the land would be as blessed as it has been now that her people are back. This is, this is just so interesting. This is so interesting. God's ancestrally chosen people, his people back in the land is what caused the land to be so blessed. This is very important. So let's move on to the next one because this gets uh, really interesting how he kind of summarizes this. And when we talk about Bible prophecy and things that are going, you know, happening in the future, Listen to the prime minister of Israel talk about what sits in the future. By the way, the day you are watching this recording, he's addressing the United Nations General Assembly. I mean, think about that for a second. The prime minister of the nation of Israel, the well-established nation of Israel, is speaking about these issues. It's remarkable. This is all Bible prophecy coming to life. Look what he says here. This is very interesting. If you ask Israelis before that, what is powerful? Well, powerful means uh, having a strong army. Uh, I concluded very uh -huh, early on, uh -huh. having served in the army, I served in a special unit, uh, 
um, an elite unit, and I described my brushes with death and clandestine missions and uh, far into uh, enemy, beyond the lines of enemy lines and many firefights that I was in. Um, and one I nearly drowned in the Suez Canal. And one I was shot while rescuing, uh, uh, while taking uh, uh, part in a, a rescue of ostriches in a hijacked plane and so on. So I, I had intimacy with the military, obviously, because I was also, uh, I also served uh, for five years in this special unit as a soldier and officer. And it's quite, a, it's a big adventure story, as you, you must have read. But, uh, but I, I understood early on that to have military power, you have to pay for all these things. You have to pay for F-35 aircrafts. You have to pay for submarines, for tanks, for drones, for cyber, for intelligence. It's all very expensive. How are you going to pay for it? Oh, well, in Israel, semi-socialist Israel that I grew up in, it's very obvious. You tax the rich. Well, the problem with that is you don't have enough rich people and they're all going to leave to other mm -hmm. places with lower taxes. Mm -hmm. So I figured that the way you can uh, actually enable Israel to be strong militarily is you have to make it strong economically. But to make it strong economically, you have to completely overhaul Israel's economic system from semi-socialism to free market capitalism. And I entered public life uh, essentially with that view And I became uh, first prime minister, then finance minister, and again prime minister. And I, I uh, led a free market revolution that turned Israel from basically a supplicant to one of the most advanced economies uh, on earth. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, when I became, when I was, uh, when I was uh, uh, first elected prime minister, Israel was well behind all the Western European eco economies, certainly the United States and Canada, in terms of uh, per capita income. Well, as a result of the changes that I put forward and I described in the book, Israel became, uh, in per capita income, uh, wealthier than Japan, France, Britain, Germany. It's actually outstripped them all. And the power, my vision was that the fusion of free markets Uh, and technology, which we invest in all the time in our military, that produces this tremendous efflorescence, economic efflorescence, and that gives you the power combination. The power combination is not merely the military, which you can now afford. It's the te civilian technology, which you now develop. And so Arab states could see, well, Israel is a strong country, and with enough resolute leadership, It will oppose Iran that threatens both of us. But Israel also produces uh, fantastic desalinization. Israel produces uh, tremendous developments in energy, tremendous digital developments, tremendous developments in health, and so on. We were the first to leave COVID because of our databases that we developed. By the way, when he talks about digital, uh, <laughs> I should probably say this, digital technology, they're still number one in the world. Okay, They're the best in this area. There is nobody better than Israel in this in this regard. And a lot of people would disagree with me, but I've been in technology for almost my whole adult life. And I can tell you this right now, so much of the best technology that I've ever used has been Israeli. God has blessed Israel, folks. Number one exporter of fruit in the world in that region. Think about that for a moment. Pretty heavy stuff. For the population and so on. Uh, we were the first to ex exit COVID uh, and uh, rebuild our economy very quickly. So the combination of civilian technology and military and intelligence capability produced this desire on the part of the Arabs to make peace with us. And you know, the attitudes, those ingrained attitudes, anti-Israel attitudes that are still rife in the Arab world begin to change because here's what happened. Because I could make these peace treaties with the Gulf states, hundreds of thousands of Israelis now fly over the skies of Saudi Arabia land in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Bahrain, and Arabs there <laughs> embrace the Israelis who are coming there, and, the, and, and Arabs and Jews are dancing in the streets. Now they're making joint ventures together. You know, they have uh, uh, economic interests, but also the views, the, the, the uh, uh, cartoonish uh, uh, absurdities of Arab propaganda are dissipated with this human contact. So the new kind of peace that we have, a peace based on, on power and interest, is actually changing the previous assumptions about Israel in many parts of the Arab world. 
Do you understand that the piece that he's actually talking about is the piece we read about in Ezekiel chapter 38, where it talks about not having any fenced cities? Basically, this is the piece of financial and economic security. And Netanyahu's talking about it coming to life right now in Israel, just as the Bible said. Folks, this is critically important. Now, we're going to go over two more stories because this is, uh, y y we have to put the whole picture together so that you understand it. Because so many people look at the Palestinian Authority and they make the Palestinian Authority look so wonderful and so well meaning. And these are people that just want the best for Arabs. They don't. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video for you. And this is a little risky, by the way. I just want you to understand that because on YouTube, to play a video like this, I have to be very careful how I translate this. But I am going to play a video of Mahmoud Abbas speaking a couple of weeks ago. And in this video, I am going to translate for you what he says from Arabic to English. I'm going to just do the best that I can do to translate it. I may get a few things off, but I'm pretty good at this. And I want you to listen to the extent of what he says. We're talking about seven minutes here. This is going to make you sick. And then what we're going to do after this is we're going to go back to a small portion of a video between Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, and Elon Musk, where Netanyahu makes a request that's really important. I want you to catch this because this is going to be mind-boggling, okay? It all goes back to the time and day that we're living in right now. And this is heavy stuff. By the way, guys, please give me your comments. Let me know what you think about this. Tell me what you'd like to see as we continue to do this. We're going to make these long-form videos every single Friday, and we might expand it into Monday. We're doing our best to see what we're doing. I hope you guys are enjoying this so far. Let's get into this video with Mahmoud Abbas. I'm going to tell you this right now. This man is not a good man. I don't want you to believe the lies that the media is telling you concerning him. One of the things that's very interesting about what the media doesn't see or doesn't know or isn't talking about is they are not talking about what I hear. And so I am going to show you what I hear and what I actually see, and hopefully I'll give you a better understanding of what's happening. I'm going to translate from his Arabic, and I'm going to bring it into English, and I'm hoping you're going to understand how serious this man's statements are. This guy is insane. He is filled with hate. He is a terrible, terrible person who hates the true and living God, and he hates his people. But let's play this. This is going to be mind-boggling. And then we're going to have a, I'm going to play a very short segment of Elon Musk, which will also be surprising. Uh, no, it shouldn't be surprising. But what it will be is it will be eye-opening because the prime minister of Israel has to make an appeal to somebody who isn't even a political leader to get something done that shouldn't even be happening right now. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's, uh, let me... Uh, uh, let me translate this for you and hopefully uh, we'll make some sense of this for you. Here we go. I need to clarify something that the European Jews are not Semitic. They're not Semites. They have nothing to do with Semitism. This began in 900 A.D. The Khazar Kingdom near the Caspian Sea, it was a Tatariya Kingdom, a Tartar Kingdom, that converted to, Jeru uh, to Judaism. He's referring to the 11th century, by the way. And all its population left. They, they left for Russia and Western and Eastern Europe. They spread there, referring to the Jews, and the forefathers of Ash Ashkenazi Jews, or the fathers of Ashkenazi Jews. So when we listen to them talk about being Semitic or anti-Semitic, the Ashkenazi Jews, they say that Hitler killed them because they were Jews. And that Europe hated them because they were Jews. But, but that's not true. This is exactly what happened. The reason why they hated them 
is because of what they were doing in meeting circles, social circles. Several authors like Karl Marx wrote about this. And he exactly said that the war between them was because Judaism and their contribution in society, meaning they were bad people. The Europeans fought against these people because of how evil they were, the Jews, which had to do with stealing from them, usury, money, that kind of thing. Everybody knows that during World War I, Hitler was a sergeant, and he said the Jews were ripping people off, stealing from people, ripping them off. In his view, the Jews were destroying everything around them. And that's why he hated them, because they were sabotaging things. He wanted to make a point clear that this wasn't about Semitism or anti-Semitism. He says, regarding the Eastern Jews, they, origi they originated from the Arab Peninsula, and they're all familiar with this history, meaning that they believe this history. I missed what he said. I think something declaration. Oh, probably the Belfort Declaration between uh, President Wilson. They were in full agreement regarding how this was worded concerning the Jews being who they were. So America was a partner in this declaration. So he's asking who invented the Jewish state? He said Britain and America, not just not just Britain on, it, on its own. The U.S. was not even a member, was not even a member of the League of Nations. And I, and I think he says America forced the League of Nations to include their purposes in bringing the Jews in. So he's saying that we should accuse so he's saying the Jews are the enemy because they've taken away their homeland and they're the ones that deserve to be accused because they took away the homeland oh okay let me let me pause this so I think I let me let me go back I believe that what he's saying here is he's saying that the that America and Britain should be uh it should be their fault because of what they did in stealing the land from the Palestinians and giving it to the Jews I believe that's exactly what he said I'd have to go back and listen to it again but I'm almost certain that that's that's what he said so uh, uh and then he goes in to talk about the population of Israel let's get into that real quick so 1948, the population of Israel, I think he said something like 600,000. And he said in 48 to 49, they occupied, I think he said something like 70-something percent of Israel. So Ben-Gurion and Churchill worked together. And says, I have a problem because I need Jews from Europe, is what he's telling him. I'm short of people, and I need more people. And, and he's saying, Churchill is saying that I can't get you those people from over there. So after World War War, I missed that last part. I missed it. The only ones I can get you are the Jews that are coming out of the Arab countries. That's what he says he said. So Ben-Gurion said, God forbid, I don't want the Jews that are from Arab countries. Wow, what a, wow, that's crazy. Ben-Gurion said, brother, those Jews of the Arab countries, they look like Arabs, they eat like Arabs, they eat the same food. And Churchill said, do whatever you want, but there is no other solution. So not only did Ben-Gurion agree, he sent his people to Iraq. 
to kill, destroy, to oh, to kill and destroy the area to force Jews in Iraq to immigrate to Israel. He's saying this also happened in Egypt with the Lavun affair. And what happened in Morocco happened the same way. They were forcing Jews out of those countries to come to Israel through pressure of coercion and murder. I mean, can it get any more satanic than that? And I, and I promise you, my translation may have been a little bit off because he was going uh, faster than normal, but I promise you that that translation is going to be darn near accurate. And I'm mind boggled at the fact that people continue to believe his lies. I, I, I'm just mind boggled by it. I, I'm blown away. I hope that you listening to this video and my translation of it helps you to better understand the fact that Abbas has no desire to want to see a two-state solution. He hates Jews and he will not be satisfied until they are wiped off the face of the earth. That's the reality of it. It's ugly, it's never acceptable, and it should be fully condemned on every level. I want to close off with this one story because this is worthwhile. We talked about this, by the way, earlier this week. Benjamin Netanyahu directly made an appeal to Elon Musk. And I want to play the portion that exchanged between Elon Musk and Benjamin Netanyahu, where basically he praises Elon Musk for a little while. And then he asks Elon Musk a very simple question. He says, listen, are you gonna, can you join me in an effort to combat anti-Semitism? And Elon Musk responds to him and gives him a little bit of a back and forth I'm going to let you listen to about three to four minutes of this. And then after we listen to it, I want to make one brief commentary on it. And then we'll wrap it up because we've gone over a lot of material here. So here it is. Let me play it. I know your commitment to free speech. I respect that because I think it's an integral. It's the foundational thing of, of democracies, really. But uh, I also know your opposition to anti-Semitism. You've spoken about it, uh, tweeted about it. Uh, and all I can say is I hope you find within the the confines of the First Amendment, the ability to uh, stop not only anti-Semitism or roll it back as best you can, but any collective uh, hatred of a people that uh, you know anti-Semitism represents. Uh, and I know you're committed to that. I hope I hope you succeed in it. It's not an easy task, but I I encourage you and urge you to uh, find a balance. It's a tough one. You know, I, obviously I'm against anti-Semitism. I'm against anti really anything um, that is. Uh, you know, that promotes hate and conflict. Um, and I'm in favor of that, which helps build society and take us to a better future um, for humanity collectively. Uh, the one access idea that I have, and I, I don't even know if it's technically possible, is to prevent the use of, uh, you know, bots, armies of bots oh, yeah. to, uh, to replicate and amplify it. So at least if you get a crazy guy and a, a hateful guy, let him be speaking for one voice rather than uh, arming, uh, you know, an army of, mi an, an, an army of fake millions to, uh, to do this. Absolutely. This is, this is actually a super tough, super tough problem. Um, and um, it's part of the, really, I'd say that maybe the single, single most important reason that we're moving to having a small uh, monthly payment uh, for uh, use of the X system is uh, it's, it's, it's the only way I can think of to combat uh, vast armies of bots, uh, because a, a bot costs a fraction of a penny, call it a tenth of a penny. But if, if, uh, if somebody even has to pay you know, a few dollars or something, some, some minor amount, the, the, the effective cost of, of bots is very high. And then you also have to uh, get a new payment uh, me method every time you have a new bot. So th that, that actually, the constraint of how many different you know, credit cards you can find even on the dark web or whatever. Um, th this uh, and, and and then pr so prioritizing uh, posts that are written by uh, basically ex premium subscribers. Um, and we're, we're actually going to come out with a lower tier pricing. For, so it's, you know, just we just want we want it to be just a small amount of money. Th this is the uh, uh, and it's a longer discussion, but in my view, this is actually the only defense against vast armies of bots. What's the model that a democratic country, and I have to say Israel will be always a democratic country. What it, does a democratic country do? How does it cooperate with other democracies? How does it cooperate with other nations to get a handle on this, I don't want to say on this, I don't want to say this demon that has been released 
Could, uh, you didn't create a demon, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> you didn't create a demon. But you created the blessing, and it's got a curse next to it. It doesn't come, doesn't come free. And I think we don't, we don't have much time. And I, I think this is the single most important development uh, in our lifetime, and in many ways, in, perhaps in history. So we, we don't have much time to deal with shaping our future. And, and that, is, that is really my uh, greatest interest for my country, but not only for my country, for, for everyone. So here's my only thought, and I expounded upon this substantially on Monday, I, or Tuesday, I believe. I dedicated a whole show to this, a live show. But let me just say that I am disgusted by the fact that the president of the United States refused to give Netanyahu an audience in the White House to talk about combating anti-Semitism, amongst many other issues that they should be talking about. And yet he has to make an appeal to Elon Musk to be able to combat it. Folks, this is the world that we are living in. We are living in the last days. We are facing end times anti-Semitism like you would not even believe. And it is all a picture of everything we know the Bible says would be coming. Listen, folks, here's the deal. Christ could come at any moment. We need to wake up. The stories that are around us are astounding. The level of deception is deep. And what we're seeing right now is mind-boggling. Let's wake up. Here it is, guys. We're in the last days. Really hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, please uh, let us know your comments. Subscribe. Like this. We really appreciate you doing that. Let us know what you think about this stuff. We're going to continue to do more of these types of videos. The hopes are to educate you, to build you up in the things of God, that you would know the biblical perspective and the geopolitics. We hope you guys have been blessed. God bless you guys.